Tales from Azeroth. As always here at the Pig and Whistle Inn in Stormwind, I go for a variety of subjects with regards to World of Warcraft. So grab a bottle or a pint, sit back and enjoy. Today's subject we're going to be going over TBC raids, what you can look f- uh, in them or what you can sort of experience within them and sort of going over the mechanics of the bosses, the trash within them and it's going to be... Um, it's going to be looking over Karazhan, Magtheridon's lair, and also Gruul's lair. Karazhan is obviously the bigger of the three raids, so we're going to start with that one, and there is a lot to get through. But, as always, we're going to be jumping into the weekly stuff, and uh, as well as the weekly stuff, we have had the uh, date for 9.1, and it is the 29th of June and the 30th of June for NA and EU, respectively. So, the Mythics this week, the Mythic of Fixes, we have Tyrannical, Inspiring, Necrotic, and Prideful. Tyrannical, obviously the bosses and their mobs that they summon are a bit tougher, so be wary of that. Inspiring, there's going to be a mob that has an aura around it, and this aura means that you can't CC other mobs that are within that pack and around that mob so either cc that mob or kill it very fast and necrotic is something for the tanks to watch out for it's a stacking debuff that can be removed either by not getting hit for a certain amount of time using a kyrian vial using an immunity like bubble or whatever there's a few ways to get rid of it but just make sure that you get a little bit of help to get rid of these necrotic stacks and manage them really well for the uh, world boss this week, it is Valinor, the Light of Eons, and that is the Bastion world boss, 250 anima as always, and some potential gear as well. The weekly event for this week is Mr. Pandaria Time Walking, so make sure you hop in, do some Mists, Time Walking Dungeons, get a few pieces of gear, and possibly a mount if you're going for that um, currency mount for the Mr. Pandaria one this week. The dungeon quests this week are for Necrotic Wake and Theatre of Pain, so make sure you hop into them, get a little bit of anima, and uh, yeah, (laughs) for next week. The Midsummer Fire Festival is actually starting within this week. It won't be until later next, or later on. It's the 21st that it starts, and it goes on until the 5th of July, so they are definitely some good things to look out for in uh, retail wow at the moment but let's go back a few years let's go back to tbc and look at karazhan and what karazhan has in store for us so obviously with karazhan if you're looking to progress it it might be best to bring a repair bot and a warlock is also very nice the warlock mainly for damage firstly is really good warlock damage is very good right now but also the summon so there's a two sort of checkpoints within karazhan and these checkpoints can only be acquired quite a ways in to the raid and this is just in case you wipe and have to run all the way back through the raid instance it's not good fun it does take a long time and you can easily get lost if you do not know your way so having a warlock there just to summon people who might not know their way who might have had to run in because they died in an awkward spot is always a very useful thing to have but we have uh, obviously at the very start of the raid midnight midnight is uh, more the more tanky a tank needs to be on the horseman itself and you just have to stack on midnight's ass pretty much as midnight has a charge effect now this boss is super simple honestly ran in there tank and spanked it nice and easy not too much to it really as long as you're all stacking on the 
uh, arse of the horse is nice and easy to complete. Don't do what I did and have your water elemental on aggressive and your water elemental pulls the pack behind during the boss fight. Makes it extra tough and, you know, it's not necessarily needed. It did complete the boss, but, you know, it made it a little bit more tougher, to be honest. So, Midnight's very nice and easy. Tank and Spank, you just have the more tankier tank on the horseman, I'd say, and stack on the horse's ass. The trash packs after midnight, uh, I would very much recommend, these are the dancer trash packs, you would very much recommend the hunter or any sort of ranged pull these to the staircase leading up, which is a good line of sight for a paladin to pick them up, or possibly a warrior with demo shout, that kind of thing. But if you've got a paladin, definitely utilise the consecration and run them down through that choke point of the stairs. They don't do much, they just have a couple range attacks. Just be careful not to pull aggro from the tanks. We get to Morose now. And Morose is not too bad of a boss. All you have to do, there's six potential mobs. and Or there's six potential mobs that can spawn with Morose. And uh, only four of them will be active within the dungeon. Or the raid, sorry. So what we did was, honestly, it's not that big of a deal. You'd utilise some CC if you want, but just kill them in a specific order. It's There's usually a healer first, that kind of thing. You can burn these down. You can have all four of them up and morose. It shouldn't be a problem at all with the DPS that people can bring at the moment. It is nice and easy. Just make sure that you're, you know going one by one on the ads fit leave morose for last make sure you can add one by one and it's nice and simple there the hallway to the maiden of virtue boss the trash packs in there are just tank and spank really um they have one ability that you kind of need to watch out for and that is a jealousy debuff and pretty much when you have the jealousy debuff, you don't attack them because the tax will be thrown back at you and you'll hurt yourself pretty much. And, you know, with two healers in the instance, it's not going to be fun for them. You kind of want, you know, to minimize the amount of damage that everyone takes while in the raid because, yeah, you only have two healers for a 10 man run. You're not going to have more. It would really, um, would really hit you in terms of like dps checks and it's also not needed mostly so when you get to the maiden of virtue there is it's in a circular room and pretty much you stand in a circle around the boss this is the ranged and the boss has a consecration this consecration deals a bit of damage plus it silences you so if you have a warrior tank definitely make sure that the warrior tank is going to pick this up because the paladin tank will just straight up not be able to get any sort of aggro Because they won't be able to cast spells. It's that simple. Uh, The consecration is always there on the boss. And you have to stay out of it. But when the Maiden of Virtue casts Repentance. You want to all move into the consecration. The Repentance will go out on everyone. You'll You'll take a ticking damage of that consecration. And then it will break the Repentance. And you simply move back out. It's nice and simple. It's very much paladin um paladin spells with the repentance if uh, you do get hit by repentance you can either immunity it or you can do a different strat where the uh, tanks will bring the maiden of virtue around the entire room to everyone that's in that room for the consecration and to get repentance off of that target now it's a lot easier if you just all move into the consecration because that way the tank's not moving the boss, it doesn't get as messy, that kind of thing. You just watch yourself, you watch your little timer to see when Repentance is going to cast. You just move in a couple seconds beforehand, nice and easy, very simple. After Maiden of Virtue is down, you have the Trash Packs after her, which is towards the Opera event, and you have multiple things. So you have Skeletal Ushers, and these uh, I would recommend Shackling one if possible. And they freeze you in place and they can't be taunted, so nuke them fast. The performers, you move them from the spotlight. And the stagehands that are also behind the opera event, they hit like a truck. 
So definitely be wary of them. The stagehands hit like a truck. But the performers, you move them from the spotlight and you can stand in the spotlight yourself to get a damage increase. Uh, this is what it would have given them if they were still in the spotlight. But definitely be careful with the stagehands. They really do hit like a truck. You're going to pull one and get absolutely smacked down by it. It's not good fun. <laughs> the opera event. So this one's a bit weird. You can have obviously three different opera encounters. You can have Little Red Riding Hood, Wizard of Oz and Romeo and Juliet. We'll start off with Little Red Riding Hood. The only sort of mechanic is that if he makes you Little Red Riding Hood, you kite him around the stage and run away. That's literally the entire mechanic. Uh, someone in your party will get turned into a gnome with a little red hood. You just run him around the outside of the stage and that's it. For about 10 seconds or so, he'll be chasing you. And if he catches you, you die. It's kind of that simple. So that's the only real mechanic of that fight, to be honest. Moving on to the Wizard of Oz, you have Dorothy and Tito and uh, you just need a tank to pick this up. Don't kill Tito, by the way, because it will enrage Dorothy. So Roar, who is the lion, can be permafeared. So if you have a warlock, great. If you have a priest, that's it, great as well. He'll just be permafeared. Scarecrow uh, can get blinded or he can get disorientated when any sort of fire is on him. He's very vulnerable to fire. So basically, you can just keep a fire spell on him and he'll forever be disorientated so you won't need a tank to pick him up and tin man is the last of the four mobs and uh, you want a tank to pick him up initially for a threat and then just kite him around because he does hit really hard but the downside to tin man is that he rusts so basically the tank can pick him up with the initial threat and then he can kite him around and tin man will slowly get slower and slower throughout the encounter so you just want to focus down Dorothy nice and easy and then deal with the others at a later stage. Either if you've got permafear, you know, you disorientate the scarecrow with a fire spell and then you've got the other tank running Tin Man around at the pace of a snail. The third and final opera event is Romeo and Juliet. And uh, basically Juliet is the first uh, mob that you will fight. You have to counterspell her heal and dispel her buffs. Nice and simple. Romeo is kind of the same, except you've got to face him away from the raid and that he has a stacking debuff that needs to be dispelled on the tank and you also have to dispel his buffs that he gets, his self buffs. Now, after they both hit 50%, they both become active. Make sure your other tank is going to pick up Juliet when she becomes active again. And it's the exact same tactics, but they do have to die within 10 seconds of each other. If they don't, one of them will res, and then it will become a bit messy, you know, more longevity, etc. So they need to die within 10 seconds of each other and make sure that they do. Otherwise, it will be really annoying to get back to where you were, pretty much. The trash after the opera event is very much a tank and spank sort of deal. So the ghosts that are purple, they do hit hard. And the green ones are a lot more forgiving. They hit like wet noodles, to be honest. The arcane watchers after the opera event, they give a debuff and uh, you basically just run out of the group. It's basically an arcane explosion on yourself. It's not tough to miss. You just hop out of the group, stand there, wait for the debuff to drop, and then you can move back into a group. Nice and simple. Or another idea is you just fully spread out from the raid your entire raid spreads out pretty much arcane anomaly packs are just nuke them down a hunter is uh, the best option here to pull them back into the previous room because this is where the curator is and he does patrol and he does have a big aggro radius so definitely would recommend a hunter pulling these mobs back into the previous room just to nuke them down because they're all funneled in through this little tunnel or this little archway, I should say. Now, moving on to the curator. Basically, it's a very straightforward thing. You kill the ants straight away. He'll spawn these little um, like uh, electric balls. You just kill them. There'll be about 10 of them, I believe. 
and you spread out with these electric balls because they do pulsate AOE. So just make sure you're spread out a little bit and there is not a lot of cleaving going on. And you pop cooldowns when he does his evocation. This is basically because he takes 200% increased damage and a threat drop. So basically you never go above the second uh, tank because... Yeah, you don't want to get aggro and then get bitch slapped by the curator. Nice and simple, that boss. He's dead. He's done and dusted. It's good fun seeing a, like bigger numbers when he's taking 200% increased damage. The trash after the curator pack, you have an arcane protector. And uh, he reflects certain types of damage. And he does hit like an absolute truck. So, basically, the types of damage are physical and magical. They He'll basically have a retaliation if you hit him with physical and he'll have a little arcane missile if you hit him with magical the arcane missile isn't that bad the retaliation for physical is a lot worse i would say it's more melee damage that um like actually being in melee where you're going to feel this pain because hunters who are physical damage only get the arcane missiles treatment they don't get the retaliation like warriors do and he will cast a buff on himself that will slow him but it will increase his damage with melee attacks, so you, the tank just has to kite away. Nice and simple, that one. The mana feeders in the library, they are immune to all caster damage. It is only physical attacks that you can use to kill these. So definitely make sure that you're not caster heavy, or at least you have one hunter, which seem to suffice, to be honest. One hunter and one tank warrior seem to be more than enough to get these down in good time, in all honesty. The mana warps, uh, they explode at low health, so kill them one at a time, because we had a problem where we killed two at the same time, and it wiped us. It completely wiped the raid, because we had no idea what they did. So you kill one at, like early on. You can also LOS this damage and outrange it, but I would recommend LOSing, as it is a lot easier. So once it's at like 5%, you just throw in a couple of ice lances, you let the tank do the rest of the damage, and the rest of the ray group just hide and LOS the damage that is going to come out of that mana warp. And uh, yeah, just don't ever kill them at the same time, it is really not good. There is an aura from... Uh, it basically increases the mana cost of your spells, and you've got to LOS them. It's nice and simple again, these mana warps. So then you come to uh, the uh, Sator. I can't really say his first name. Terristian? Terristian Ilhoof, I, I'm going to say that. Basically, he spawns an ad, or he spawns ads, and when they spawn, you just got to kill them. There's loads of little imps. Um, he'll have a imp to start with. I forget the name of it. He'll have a pet imp. It's a bigger imp than the others. But you just kill that off whenever he's there. And uh, you kill the imp first. He chooses one person and puts them in the circle in the middle of the room. And you have to kill the chains holding them in place. Because otherwise that person will get sacrificed. It's nice and easy. And you just got to keep the mob sort of under control. So if you have a paladin tank... It's best to put him on these portals because there's three at the back of the room and he might be able to pick them up a lot easier than, say, a warrior. Once they get to my sort of strat for this, we killed them off immediately, but that led to a lot of mana problems. Um, so my strat for this would be let them gather up about, you know, for 15 seconds, just nuke them all down. They are very squishy, these imps. So just nuke them all down in one big go and then go back to the boss, don't necessarily constantly AoE these imps, because you will run out of mana very quickly, especially if you don't have that many mages or AoE potential in your group. So kill the adds when they spawn, or give them like a 15 second window to gather all up and that kind of thing. Kill the chains if someone's been sacrificed, and kill the bigger imp as soon as it spawns. He'll constantly summon it, so make sure it's constantly dying off. After Ill Hoof, you go straight to the Shade of Aram. And uh, this one was actually where we first hit our, you know, head in a brick wall. Basically, he's got multiple things. Uh, you don't want to get caught in the blizzard. It'll be half of the room and it rotates around in sort of a semicircle. So the 
south side of the room will be completely in a blizzard and the north side might be fine. The entire right hand side might be a blizzard, left hand side will be fine, that kind of thing. You just rotate it and it rotates clockwise around this circular room. So nice and easy to figure out. Plus there's a little blue tornado that you can see that shows where the blizzard is starting, you know, before it's actually become a blizzard almost. Uh, the biggest or another AOE potential that he has is he'll pull everyone to the middle of the room and he'll slow everyone and start to cast an arcane explosion. Simple, you move to the side of the room, no need to worry about it, just tuck yourselves in the alcoves, you will be fine. The AOE or the arcane explosion isn't as big as everyone thinks it is it is a lot smaller so you have a lot of sort of um leeway to go with this the biggest mechanic is the flame wraith ability now with flame wraith you basically do not move at all it's very safe if people do if everyone just stops moving but the people with flame wraith do not move at all you can't cross anyone else's flame wraith Make sure that that is something that you do not do. Even if you don't have one yourself, if you cross someone else's flame wraith, you will wipe the raid. It is that simple. So it's be it's very safe to just not move at all. If you lose a bit of DPS, that's fine. But you'd rather be safe than sorry with this ability. The Shade of Aran fight is kind of a ticking time bomb with Aran's mana. But also you just want to focus on survival mainly. So he casts three different types of spells, Fireball, Frostbolt and Arcane Missiles. You let the Arcane Missiles go through and you want to be interrupting the Fireball more than anything because that's the one that's going to one shot. Arcane Missiles, you can do some stuff to sort of protect yourself. The Arcane Missiles will still kill you if they all go through and you don't get a heal in that time. But it's like a four second channel so the chance of you dying are a little bit lower than just a straight up fireball to the face. So lock him on fire and uh, you don't want to lock him on everything because if you lock him on everything, the person who has aggro will be getting hit by him and it might be a ranged DPS usually that we found out because we want to you know, push him as much as we can in terms of DPS before his enrage almost hits. So only lock him on fire is my best advice. Arcane if you really need to, but Frostbolt I think is the safer bet to let go through. At 40% health, the there will be four elementals that spawn around the room. Now if you have a Warlock, you can just ask, my personal favourite tactic is to banish one and to fear one permanently. You just have the Warlock babysit them and you kill the other two. If you have two Warlocks, you have one, two banishes, two fears, don't need to deal with them at all. Your warlocks just babysit them completely. Nice and easy. You carry on killing the boss as normal. But while these elementals are up, he will still do his blizzard. He will still do his natural rotations, that kind of thing. Flame wraith. So just be keeping an eye out on their mechanics still, as they are probably the ones that will wipe you. But the elementals can spawn at a really bad time when a blizzard just comes up. So you've got to be able to adapt to the situation that occurs but if you've got a warlock it really does help this fight out with the banish and stuff so definitely definitely would recommend that that is a run for you he is very tough and sort of a brick wall for most people the trash after the shade of a run is very much an easy tank and spank to be honest no problems at all in all regard the chess event now the chess event there's no real way to explain it it's very much you got to kill their king it is a chessboard you kill their king first it's nice and simple as long as you got someone controlling the king that you know and uh, the water or not the water elementals the queen is also a very good piece like you probably will win if you got someone controlling the queen and king it's probably very simple to be honest but there's no way I can explain the chess event. It is just you kill their king and if your king dies, you die. Like you will wipe. Medieval cheat and take you out of your, uh, you know, your pawn, your piece. Uh, or he'll set fire to a certain, you know, place on the board and you just got to move that uh, 
piece on your side of the board away from that fire to stop it taking increased damage. Nice and simple. So for Prince, the very last boss, before that you have uh, just a few like blood boil packs, I believe they're called, something like that. They hit relatively hard, just face them away from the raid as they do have a frontal bleed. Just get as many or as few people hit by that as possible. Nice and simple. So Prince. So there is a kind of cheesy way to do this and then there's the actual way. So the cheesy way is you tank him up against a wall and casters and healers stood in the doorway and melees move out when Enfeeble is cast. And pretty much what Enfeeble does is it puts you to 1 HP. Not 1%, 1 HP. So anything will kill you. Unless you obviously have an immunity or like barriers. I, myself, being a mage, I'm a frost mage, so I tend to keep barriers up on myself anyway. So I technically have like 1.5k HP. But, you know, it's just very scary seeing 1 HP on your uh, character. After Enfeeble ends, you will be returned to full health. But he will summon Infernals on the platform. And these just stand there and deal pulsating AoE. He'll also have a Nova that all the melee need to line a sight if he's tanked up against the wall. Just make sure that you're out when Enfeeble is about to be cast because he will also put a aura on himself that deals a bit of damage to any melee. And if you get hit with Enfeeble and he's got this aura, you just insta dead because you had one HP, that kind of thing. So as long as you're not as long as you play it safe with your melee. It should be very easy, in all honesty. Now, going back into the raid, we're going to talk about Nether Spite. Now, Nether Spite is a boss that I haven't done. I haven't killed yet. He is a very tough boss. But basically, the fight breaks down like this. There's three different types of portals. Uh, The red portal, tanks will always use this. And whoever the beam is on will have threat on Nether Spite. And uh, each tank needs to switch... Uh, who's using the red po- or the red portal each phase. So he'll go into a standing phase and then he'll go into a banished phase. We'll get to the banished phase in a bit. The blue portal, casters will take this, or a warlock that spams drain life. So, you t- so the best idea is to take five stacks of this and then move out, let the boss take five stacks and then you move back in, that kind of thing. You need obviously multiple casters for this if you are not using the warlock strat. And this goes the same with the red portal. You obviously want your tank to move in and out of this red portal because they all have negative effects and that kind of thing. And the green portal, the other tank can soak this as well or any healer if they wish to do so. And uh, This should never not be soaked by anyone as it will rapidly heal the boss if it is not soaked. So definitely make sure that this one is, uh, you know, got someone in between it because you don't want that to happen. But the banished phase is he'll go up into the air. No one can really attack him, but or you can attack him. But I think most people are choosing to just run away and outrange his breath because the breath does a lot of damage. So he'll just go up into the air, no portals will be spawned, and he'll just randomly target people with the breath, like his nether storm breath or something, and it will deal a lot of damage. You can just outrange this, you can all huddle in a corner, wait, and then go back into where he is, and pick up your portals from there. Just make sure that you give your tank a good time to pick it up, and you don't start blasting immediately, because it is a threat reset so you don't want to go crazy with that. But that's Karazhan. It's something, to be honest. It is very much something. It's good fun. It's good fun learning all of the different pools. It's good th- good fun learning, you know, butting your head against it sometimes. It can be a bit grinding sometimes, but you'll get there in the end. So moving on to Gruul's Lair. This is the 25-man dungeon. Dungeon raid. So this one has, this is definitely not as big, but you've got uh, two bosses. And uh, the first boss is basically a council type fight. You have five bosses, technically, and uh, these are all of them. So you've got 
Kigla the Crazed, Blind Eye the Seer, Hiking Mulgar, Ulm the Summoner, and Cross Firehand. So basically, I'm going to do these in kill order, by the way. So Blind Eye the Seer is the first target to kill. All you have to do is uh, counterspell his heal, and he can be stunned as well. This can be tanked by any kind of tank. The second kill target is Ulm the Summoner, and this is the Warlock uh, Ogre. And all you have to do is banish and fear the Hellhounds, and when Ulm dies, you kill the adds. Again, this can be tanked by any tank. You can cleave these two, actually, so you can stack them on top of each other. Just make sure the Hellhounds or the Fellhounds don't have their fear or banish, you know, run out. As long as you keep the adds in check, you will be fine. The third target is Crush Firehand, and his fireball is his, he fireballs his main target, and he has a Blast Wave. So no melee will go on this target. The melee's third target is Kigla the Crazed, but we'll get to him. And a mage needs to tank this mob. So the way a mage tanks this mob is by using spell steel on the shield that Crush Firehand applies to himself. And this shield reduces magical damage taken by 75%. So if you do not have the shield, you will basically get one shot unless you have multiple barriers, fire ward, even if you just ice block it, that kind of thing. But you definitely want to help out the mage target or get this guy down very quickly because I think there's some weird timings with the spell steal and him putting up another shield and stuff like that. So the ranged will go on to Crush as their third target and the melee will go on to Kigler the Crazed for their fourth or their third target. So technically the fourth target now. And he has an AoE knockback and hexes. So any druid can tank this boss. But if you have a druid tank, that's a lot better, obviously, because they have um, a more sizable health pool, plus a just tankier in general. But a boom king can suffice in tanking this because the boom king can generate a lot of rage. But it's basically... A druid that needs to tank it mainly because the hex if he hexes your target it will just go to the next highest threat and you do not want that at all and the aoe knockback just make sure that you're taking care if you see the aoe knockback and you're a bit low just stay out wait to get topped up by the healers and head back in and then finally you kill high king mulgar and all he does is he whirlwinds so melee needs to be wary of this and he does a fear when he reaches 50 percent and he will fear the main tank and whoever he charges. So make sure that the off tank is ready to taunt when the main tank does get feared. But that is the first boss of Gruul's Lair. Nice and simple, really. And then you move on to the big bad guy himself, Gruul. So the DPS check, really. He has a stacking debuff every 30 seconds. And this is a 15% damage increase. Just a flat 15% damage increase every time. So when it gets to like 100% or whatever, 90%, 105 you're going to be looking at basically a wipe if he's not nearly dead at all. Uh, of tank needs to always be second on threat, plus in melee range, because he does have a hateful strike, kind of like Patchwork did in Naxxramas. So he'll hit the off tank and whoever's in melee for quite a sizable amount every 20 seconds so definitely make sure that your off tank is second on threat and within AoE or melee distance he also has avoidable aoe damage from the cave so this also scales with uh his debuff or his buff his 15 percent like damage increase buff so definitely don't get hit by this it's basically rubble that falls from the caves like roof you can just start sidestep it but if it does get to a point where he's got 105 DPS increase, like, this is really going to slap. Like, you might get even one shot by it. It's that kind of thing. He has a Grand Slam, and what this does is it gives a Grown Lord's Grasp. Grown Lord's Grasp. And uh, when you get five stacks of this, you get stunned and Gruul casts Shatter. And make sure everyone is spread out before this, because it deals more damage the closer people are to each other. So if you're stacked on top of each other, it's going to deal 10,000 damage. If you're 10 yards apart, 
it will do 8,000 damage. If you're 20 yards apart, it will do nothing, like 3,000 damage, 2,000 damage. So you really want to be spread out for this, and you do not want to take the risk. It's a massive room. Make sure you utilize that space. And he basically has a mass AoE silence as well. So basically, you've got to top up the tanks before this happens because it's unavoidable and you're just going to be silenced and you've got to deal with it for a bit. So definitely top up the tanks beforehand and you should be good to go with Gruul's Lair. Nice and simple, really. Now, the final one is uh, basically uh, Magtheridon's Lair. I couldn't think of the name. But this is a one boss encounter, so you know we've gone from about ten bosses to two to one, so really cutting it cutting it down. But Magtheridon's Lair is a three phase fight, and the first phase is two minutes long. Basically, Magtheridon is banished in this phase, and you have to kill the adds, and you have to keep them quite you know far apart. If you have three tanks, you can utilize two tanks to tank two of the adds each, so make it nice and easy. But the ads are called channelers, and they do a shadow bolt volley. They do a dark mending, either on themselves or nearby allies. They summon infernal, so make sure that your ranged are spread, and they will fear people at random, you know, as they all, as everything else does in TBC Classic. And when they die, they give a stacking buff to the other channelers, and this is a 20% increase in damage and a 30% increase in their casting speed so you've got to be really on point with the interrupts for their heals and uh, before the two minutes is up you would definitely want at least you know three out of these five channelers dead because you want a tank free to pick up magtheridon himself so after two minutes magtheridon is released and is attackable he has three abilities he leaves fire on the ground he has a quaking ability and this Bounces plays around for 7 seconds and you can't cast during this time. So make sure that you've topped people up before. And the first quake is at 40 seconds into the encounter and then every 50 seconds after. And the third ability he has is Blast Nova. And this will wipe you. This is every 60 seconds. And 5 players that have to click on the cubes around the room to interrupt this ability. So you need 4 groups of 5 people to rotate in clicking as uh, it gives you, after you've clicked, a debuff for three minutes, making you unable to click it again once you've uh, done the interrupt. And you need to make sure that you let it channel. So you click it once, you take your hand off the keyboard, you don't do anything, you let it channel, you don't do anything else. Because if you move your character, you will get the debuff, and then suddenly someone's got to scramble over before the timer's up, and by that time, he's probably casted it and wiped your entire raid. So just let it channel. Do not touch your keyboard. Click it once. Nice and simple. And uh, phase three is at 30%. And he'll stun everyone for 10 seconds and start to cause debris from the ceiling to fall down. So make sure you push him to 30% after he's just done a Blast Nova. Because if he stuns you and then he starts casting Blast Nova, it's a wipe. I'm sorry, nothing you can do unless you've got people very quick to immune the stun like, you know, ice block and bubbles, run over and click the cubes, but a very unlikely event. So push him over to 30% just after a blast nova and uh, basically he'll, yeah, have debris fall from the ceiling. Just don't stand in it and he will keep casting blast wave. That's basically it. It means that stuff falls from the ceiling every now and again and you just got to dodge it at phase three. So those are the raids in TBC at the moment. Obviously, I've done a lot of my research, but the only raid that I've actually done myself is Kara. I have not killed Nether Spite yet and looking to do so soonish. But, you know, Kara was a fun experience, even though I got no gear, no cars to get dropped at all. But it's good fun. I want to just see Midnight drop, to be honest. It might be, you know, something to get excited about. But thank you all very much for listening. As always, do check out the social medias, check out the Twitch, the YouTube, absolutely everything. It's all on the website. Go with Valor, friend, and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye, all. Thank you.